keep rolling. Okay. I want to go to sound. Okay. And I want you to talk about the relationship uh, between your preaching and the organ. <laughs> that, that, that too uh, comes from my generation and my tradition. Uh, in part, uh, all of the great preachers of my era preach with an organ behind them. And I grew up, I came to church through music. I was a choir director from background. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably understand theory better than I play an instrument at this point. But uh, the, the dance between the two it often creates the scene. See, in, in, in my secular world, I'm a producer. You wouldn't produce a scene and not put music up under it mm -hmm. because sometimes the music replaces the script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sally comes home from work and goes up the steps and is going to the closet to take off her coat. It's the music that lets you know somebody's in the house. And all of a sudden, you, you tense up, you say, oh. <laughs> you understand? Look, look, look at how powerful and how communicative music is. Mm -hmm. So the music adds so much to the theme that if they pull the music out of it, the, the, uh, the financiers would back out of the deal. Mm -hmm. Because the script lends itself to silence so that the music can create the scene. Mm -hmm. That's all intentional. Right, right. That wasn't, uh, I was watching uh, Antoine Fisher the other night. And I hadn't seen it for a long, long time. And Viola Davis was playing the mother of uh, Antoine Fisher, his real mother. And, and, and she has almost no lines. Mm -hmm. that when he comes in to see her, she has almost no lines at all. She's in the ghetto and, and she's given him up at birth and, and, and he tells her who he is. She says, that's my firstborn son. And she starts talking. And everything's in her face. She gets up and walks out the room, doesn't say anything. And, and the biggest part of the scene has no words. Mm -hmm. And yet it's saying everything. Mm -hmm. It said to me, you know, don't judge me. I didn't want it to be like this, and here you come bringing this up. I don't want to think about this. I'm glad you're here. I'm scared you're here. I'm worried you're here. All of this without a word. A really great actor can have no lines at all, and their face can talk to you. That, that's what separates the masters from the mediocre. Denzel can, can control a room without a word. Hmm. And you can get that he was about. This called me. Okay. <laughs> he he could do that. Sorry, did that's the best I could do. No, that's right. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> everything is in his communication. Body, you know, everything, right? everything. It's risky. But so, yeah. so when you start talking about music and messaging, not only does it go back to uh, our tradition and theater, it goes all the way back to David and, and, and Saul mm -hmm. and the effect that David's harp had on Saul's demons. Mm -hmm. Music creates an atmosphere. I'm not saying that every preacher should preach with it, but for us in our tradition, there was a collaborative effort between the musicians. I, I'm very funny about who plays for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd rather have none at all than to have somebody who's just into music and he's over there running all these runs and playing all these chords. My musician has to feel me. You, you have to be in, I hardly ever look at Marcus, but Marcus knows my body language, my walk, my talk, my movement. He, he knows whether I'm going in or coming out, you know, he just knows. He just knows 20, 26 years. He's played for me almost every video you see of me, mm -hmm. from him 17 years old to him being about close, late 40s, mm -hmm. something now. He, he, he's played for me every time. Yeah. 
There, so there's a bond be, between us. One of, one of the most painful moments of Whitney Houston's funeral for me was listening at her band because I know what it is to be on the road with somebody and travel with them and you become like a family. And, and the connection, if it's not real, it won't last. If it's just a gig, it won't last. To be with certain people, you have to be called to them. You have to be called to them because so much of what passes between us is not communicated. It's not like we sit down on a plane and say, now when I get to this part, I want you to play. Right. Nah, right. no. Here's a boy who grew up uh, listening, scoring cartoons mm. and, and sitting up on the keyboard, listening at commercials, imagining what he would play up under. So for him, communication was music. And, and, and when he gets really happy, he plays the more. I've seen him play and be crying mm. so bad he couldn't see the keys mm -hmm. because he never dances. Mm. He never shouts. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like to be in crowds, but he expresses himself with his, with his fingers. I, I express myself with speaking. Mm -hmm. So when we get together, we're both preaching. Right. Yeah, we're, we're both preaching and we're both enhancing the moment. And so I think for me, music plays a part in it, whether it is a traditional organ getting behind the preaching or setting the mood for the altar call, mm -hmm. music, mu music and mood are, are are inextricably connected one to the other. One of the things that's characteristic of your preaching is uh, call and response. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, as I watch, you are, are a master at evoking call and response. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about um, evoking call and response out of an audience. I've seen you across many different audiences in many different places. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I'm, I don't mean that in a manip in manipulative sense. I think you know that. But mm. just so anybody watching this, I'm not saying you manipulate the audience. Anybody watching this, watching us talk. But I think that you are a master at evoking call and response. So talk to me about that. I think that I never want to create the atmosphere where they come to watch. So for me, the preaching moment is kind of a dialogue between us. Uh, like you go to the doctor's office, you don't want a doc doctor who just tells you about the body. You want a doctor who asks you a question, how does that feel? Does it hurt? Tell me if this hurts right here. Turn this way, breathe real deep. You, it, it's collab Truth comes through collaborative effort. And so this place we're trying to go is so sacred that I can't get there without them. Right. And so inviting them into that moment, we build that moment together and we enjoy that moment together. And Sunday week ago, we had a moment, I don't know that we've been in church that long in all the years we've been. <laughs> it, was, it was embarrassing how long we created a moment we couldn't get out of. And, uh, and everybody was just, It, it, it was unexplainable, uh, but it, it is collaborative. It is collaborative, and it has always been that way. As, as it relates to eliciting a response, I think that becomes much easier when you bring the message much closer to what I'm going through. Because when I say something that is exactly how you feel, but you didn't have the words for yes, it. That's true. You're going to endorse that, yes. <laughs> number one. Right. And so it's not the mechanisms of how do I get you to say something. It's that when I hit that spot mm -hmm. where you say that that's me right there, <laughs> you know, you got me, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and in some way you're going to bear some sign that, that identifies with that. And that is going to help me to help you. Right. And so I'm trying to help you and you have to help me help you. Like the doctor's trying to help you and you have to volunteer information in order for him to, all of his knowledge and all of his education, he still doesn't know uh, when the water's going to break. Right. He, he still doesn't know exactly when the baby's going to come. And, and so it's a, truth is derived to a collaborative 
uh, experience where we both participate and we create something. Because you must remember that while I'm preaching, I'm eating too. Yeah, I'm eating too. And so we're having, we're having dinner together with the master. And both of us are being fed simultaneously. It's not, it, it would appear that I am the chef, but not really. I'm really the waiter. I just bring it to you and serve you what he has prepared. And every now and then I, I get me a little something too back in the kitchen <laughs> on the way out, you, you know, uh, because I have to live off of that preaching as well. And I think that response comes through relativity. Yes. It, there, y- yes, there are some things that you can, you know, our church, the culture of our audience, you can say God is good. And they're going to say all the time. You say all the time. They're going to say God is good. There, there are some learned responses that we have in various situations. But those responses, if, if they are all that we seek to, to determine the value of the experience, that, that, that we have not really been effective. See, what, what I'm looking for are from or for, from you or, for example, their techniques, and I'm not, I don't mean manipulative, but one of the techniques is to evoke responses, um, have you ever, mm-hmm. have you ever experienced mm-hmm. that? You're asking me for a response. Mm-hmm. Or, or the classic one is, um, is, is there anybody here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I can hear Paul Borden say that. Is, it, right. is there anybody here? Yeah, exactly. So the audience, so when I'm teaching, people are trying to figure out if my preaching is flat. I don't mean in, mm-hmm. in this particular sermon, but I'm trying to grow as a preacher. Mm-hmm. I need techniques until I can master. So you're at the place that you, you don't need techniques because you've internalized all that and, mm-hmm. it, and it's natural to you. So I might say in a class to people, um, questions include people. Mm-hmm. And if you ask strategic questions at the right time, then the audience is going to respond. So, and you may not, you have so internalized this that you may not have, so beyond technique, and I'm, I'm okay if you can't list, but I just want to do, Mark, that you are a master at evoking response from an audience. And I think that's your body. I think your body evokes response. I think your tone I think the relativity of your truth, uh, you're hitting so close to home that I just can't sit here. Mm -hmm. All of that is together Mm -hmm. evoking response. It's your freedom that inspires my freedom. You know, if the preacher's bound, the people are bound. So if you're Mm -hmm. not going to include your body, how are you going to ask me to include Mm -hmm. mine? Mm -hmm. So if, if if we've exhausted this particular piece, are there any other techniques that you can think of? I think we're talking about how, and I struggle with how to get closer to a, a, a strong answer on how. Okay. I, I can give you a stronger answer on when. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I think if you're going to crescendo the message after the tradition that I do, you have to build it mm-hmm. with periodic windows of praise. Mm-hmm. Okay, go ahead. Because when, when I build it to a crescendo, of periodic windows of praise, I'm shifting like a stick shift from first to second. (laughs) Yeah, and if I'm gonna get to third, uh, I have to go through first and second to keep building because I'm taking it to another pitch. It's going to another level. And and, and if I were hooping, I might change keys and, and, and go up because we're going up. Okay, uh, you, you can't go from zero to 100 right. without passing 50. Right. And so building it up is, is important and it stops that feeling of uh, disconnection. You know, where we started out talking about the young preacher gets up and gives their best shot at the beginning. Right. It's because they're scared that they won't be able to get a reaction. And so they throw everything they have in the first five minutes and then they die a terrible death. Right. <laughs> uh, along the way, there, there are ways to bring the congregation with you. Mm. But you start out with them. Right. You, you don't start out... Uh, on some spiritual yacht somewhere. <laughs> you know, you start out with them. Mm-hmm. And so it starts out in a very conversational tone. Right. 
did you all see on the news the other day? I was watching so. You know, it starts there. <laughs> that gives me room to build to various levels, you see. But if I start up here, then I don't have much to go to except down here. And all you get to do is watch me slide down. See, and watching somebody slide down is not nearly as powerful as watching them build up. That's right. Is that helpful? Yeah. So we're, talk, we're talking about the close of the sermon. And, you know, we come from a tradition where there's a tremendous amount of pressure to leave people standing and shouting as the evidence that the message has been effective. And a lot of us will tear up a wonderful sermon trying to have a specific kind of close. One of the things I've noticed as I've watched you, uh, though um, we tend to, I would argue we're in a neo-Pentecostal moment, Mm -hmm. and so people focus on the Pentecostal side and the verbal expression, Mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, I I also noticed that you have altar calls, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a different kind of clothes. Mm -hmm. Um, So my sense is that you find the appropriate clothes for this particular message, Mm -hmm. given these people. Mm -hmm. But I'm putting words in your mouth, so tell me about that. You're absolutely right. I, I don't think every message is intended to end the same way. Uh, Some to be thought provoking. Uh, some to be soul stirring, some to be decision making, some to be corrective, and and you don't shout through correction. Uh, some to be directional, and and if I study a message fully, I think I told you this on the phone. <laughs> I came back from Africa. I was lit up to do this message about language. It just fascinated me. Oh, there are 2,000 different languages on the continent of Africa alone, and, and it really fascinated me understanding how the tribalism and what colonialism did and all of that kind of stuff. I just geeked about it. So I said, I'm going to come back and I'm going to preach about that, and I'm going to come from Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, and I'm going to talk about languages and, and maybe close with Pentecost, you know? And when I got through preparing to do it, I got it all ready. I asked myself one question, I said, so what's the point to the single mother who came to church with money she should have bought groceries with? How does that help her? Mm-hmm. And I couldn't find an answer for that. Mm-hmm. And I put it away and never preached it. Yeah. Somewhere, maybe at some leadership conference or where, where I'm surrounded by people who love to think about things like that. Yeah. Maybe I'll uh, revive it and have that discussion. But as a pastor, the reason I am a pastor is I love to see you grow. Mm-hmm. I, lo- I, lo- I love to see you develop. I love to see, remember, where you came from and, and to feed you and get to stay around is so much more fulfilling than to do a one night at your church and a one night over here and I didn't get to see what happened. Did it really matter? Yeah. You know, it's, it's almost a superficial exchange that doesn't give me the reward that I need. I need the reward of you coming into your own. Yeah. I was eating lunch yesterday and a woman stopped me and said, I, I, I started my business because of you. And she said, I'm, I'm, I went to X number of dollars and success for my family and all this stuff because you made me believe in myself. You made me think I could. Mm-hmm. And every time I wanted to quit, I played you. Mm-hmm. And I kept on going. She said, now I got X number of people working for me. I'm getting ready to open up another location. And, and she was teary-eyed and I was too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because if I helped that one woman, if I help that one woman put food on the table and send her kids to a better school and have a chance at a better life, that's wonderful. For, for me as an African-American preacher, it is not just about conversion cards. I converted you to Jesus, but did I disciple you into anything of significance that made your life better and changed our community? That, that is equally as important, or almost equally as important. Yeah, so... Uh, maybe, maybe they give some context to it. We still haven't done our sermon yet. Still haven't done what sermon? Uh, oh, um, I thought I was me. Yeah, I didn't know I, I was me. I didn't know. Yeah, let's go to that. 
Yeah, we, we, you know, we do have a plan. We, it, it, it. Matter of fact, all these cards, y'all know something, look at two of them, right? <laughs> so it's on a card here somewhere. Um, it's been several times in our conversation that you have recommended this sermon to me, and I obviously had the chance to uh, go and look at it, and um, I didn't know I was me. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> So I think that just listening to it, and you sent me a bunch of sermons, but that one has stood. I think that there are signature sermons that speak to us uh, or speak to people, speak to us. Um, and that feels to me, this is my language, not yours, like that's one of your signature sermons. So tell me about it. E- e- even So do this. So we were getting ready to do, you know, as we're doing as thy days, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe in some point in the future, somebody might be able to see that sermon. Mm-hmm. I want you to talk about, I didn't know I was me, because people also can go right up, after you get through describing, they can go up and see the, mm, exactly. see the fruit of the preparation. Exactly. So how did you develop? Take me through the sermon preparation process too, and I promise you, I won't interrupt you. I'll just let you flow, I, I won't interrupt you. I, I, I'm gonna be absolutely honest. <clears throat> I was prayerfully directed to go read about Gideon. And after being prompted three or four times, I went back and started reading about Gideon. (laughs) And when I started reading about Gideon, I noticed something I hadn't noticed before, which is not unlike the word, uh, that Gideon was threshing wheat in the bottom of a wine press. And, and, Someone shout already because I, <laughs> you know, I know where we're going. That's and, 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 and that, uh, what a menial task that was for who he was. Mm, mm. And the angel comes by and says, Hail, Gideon. He says, Thou art a mighty man of valor. Mm. And I'm stuck there. I can get stuck, <laughs> at, I can get stuck <laughs> on a sentence. A comma, a, a, a phrase, <laughs> and I thought to myself, there he is threshing wheat in the bottom of a wine press, trying to protect the harvest from the Philistines, I believe, mm-hmm. and uh, and he doesn't know that he's not to hide from the problem. He's going to be the one who corrects the problem. Mm-hmm. And the, and the angel calls him something that he doesn't realize about himself. You're a mighty man of valor. I don't care what you're doing right now. You're a mighty man of valor. And I thought to myself, hmm, I didn't know I was me. Hmm. And when I thought I didn't know I was me, I thought about me. Hmm. And I thought, Lord, I didn't know I was me either. Hmm. And if I would have known I was me, I would have done things a lot different. (laughs) But I didn't know, I didn't know I was me. Uh, This this point of revelation is where I'm going, but it is never going to be where I start. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because to jump directly into Gideon, for me, doesn't create the ring that the diamond sits on. Yes. Mm So I back out of the text. Once I have come in uh, like a microscope and, and, and come in close, then I back out mm-hmm. of it mm-hmm. to see the topography, not just of the text. We talked about the topography, the text and context. But I also back out to see the, the text, the subject in, in context. I didn't know I was me. What, what does it, that come from? Not just Gideon and what's going on with the armies and what era this is and the, the, all that. You should study all of that. That's in the clutter that I, I, that I brought all of the stuff out. That's in the clutter. I didn't know I was me. Goes back to before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Mm-hmm. Classified information, I ordained thee, I sanctified thee to be a prophet unto the nation. So Gabriel is uh, giving Gideon an aha moment. Mm -hmm. Those he did for, no, he did predestinate. Those he justified, he called. 
called is the point that I become aware of everything he had done without my knowledge. Before I formed thee, I knew thee, ordained thee, sanctified thee, but that was without me. When he called me, he made me aware. That's what happened in the bottom of the wine press. He made him know that you're more than what you're doing. That is a cataclysmic, explosive, powerful moment where destiny and time collide. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I just so I I went back and started preaching about the foreknowledge of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And started talking about how I was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Those he did predestinate, those he did for no, he did also predestinate. And 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 and, and that all of this was done before I ever even got here. That was his before, that I belonged to him before, that I was that I was meant to be here, said that, uh, that my sheep know my voice is stranger, they will not follow. The very fact that I recognize him, my spirit recognized what we had before. The very fact that everything relative to uh, redemption has a re-prefix on it and, and that he is re-establishing something I had with him before the foundation of the world. Eternity past, eternity present, eternity future. I started way back there, mm -hmm. okay, and set the principle as the framework because I want our church to understand that redemption, re, the, the very term redemption suggests I was his before, and that redemption is a continuation of an abbreviated love story. Mm. That, that he, he got me back, that he found me and <laughs> I was lost. Mm. But it was not our first meeting. Mm. That he, he loved me and, 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 and I was lost and he goes hunting for me. I hear the sound of my beloved, behold, he cometh skipping upon the mountains like a young heart, mm -hmm. like a young roe. Mm -hmm. He cometh for me, he peers through the ladder and says, rise up my beloved and come away. I was his before he called me. But when he called me, he reminded me where I belong. Mm -hmm. so, so you understand what I'm saying? So, so I, I wanted them to understand those principles because I am afraid that those principles that we just rushed through will die with our generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not against the younger preachers and what they're doing, but so many of them, not all of them, but so, so many of them are preaching message about Biggie Fries and, and Beam Me Up Scotty and Beyonce to the left, to the left, whatever is hot. It's just, just hot to get the people. And use a hot subject. I use hot subjects to feel like busted loose and things were hot in my day. <laughs> that was hot in my day. So I'm not hating on you. That was hot in my day. But don't do it at the expense of sacrifice biblical truths that have been passed down for centuries. We cannot let this generation lose those biblical truths that define us as Christians. And so I wanted to, as a pastor, I want to wolf-proof my congregation so that they can readily discern between hamburger and steak. They know what's real, they know what's chopped up, they know what's, what matters, they know what's important. And so the first part of the message was to use this as an opportunity to say that you're not an afterthought in God's mind, that God didn't just decide to save you because you lost your house and you were living on the street, that God foreknew you. He pre-planned it. In fact, he allowed you to go through whatever you had to go through to bring you to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you were his before, and this is a continuation of a love song, and all of your sin life was a comma. That's all it was, was a comma. And, and, and from that to say, I, I didn't know I was me. The, the sentence alone mm -hmm. uh, apologizes, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> confesses. Uh, it, it, it is humility because it represents that this is not just a result of some strategic marketing, planning, mm -hmm. development, staff development, training, right. that there is some mysterious tremendon about this that goes beyond anything that you would call natural that, that, that is so divine that I didn't know I was me and the greatest gift you gave me was to, to know who I was. Hmm. The, the, uh, aside from knowing you was to know me b b b because, b because if, if I know you and, and, and don't know me, then what can I do? 
because Paul says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But if I know the Christ but don't know the I, I cannot do it. So, so thank you for showing me me because I thought I was who they said I was. I thought I was what I did before. I thought I was what happened to me. I thought I was what I went through. I thought I was this wheat. I thought I was in this wine press. I thought I would be in this wine press the rest of my life. And all of a sudden you said something to me that makes me throw down the threshing and throw down the wine press and pull myself up out of here and shake the dust off myself and say maybe I'm called to something higher than my situation indicates. Mm. That was the substratum of the plan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. And, and the text becomes an instrument for delivering the execution of that plan to say that it could be possible that you're more than you think you are. Yeah. And, and that, was, that was my thought process. And so after I had framed in the, the, the relevance of the whole concept of the theological understanding that, that, that I was his before, mm -hmm. then I have to identify the point that we connected at the point that he called me, that he brings me into an awareness, you're a mighty man of valor. Hmm. The struggle between hmm. how I see myself and how you see me. Hmm. The struggle, that, see, that, that's the next battleground is you say I'm a mighty man of valor, but look at this. You say I'm a woman of God, but look at that. You say I'm a great leader, but look at this. My, my, I'm about to be evicted. You, you say, you know, I, I'm, I'm holy, but, but, but I have lust issues. You say I'm such and such, but I have such. The, the struggle between what I'm called to be and how I see myself is why I need the word of God yeah. because it is through the word of God that I further embrace what you said over the evidence in front of me right now. The Philistines are coming. They've been killing us. They've been burning up our wheat. I think I need to do this. But you're saying, wait a minute, you're going to do something with me. Watch this. And this is what's cool for which I have no point of reference, mm. wasn't trained for, yeah. had no background in, mm. didn't suspect was in me, and you're gonna snatch me from the wine press to the battlefield, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> you understand? And, and God, <laughs> you, 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 know you, you, know you better what? say something, you stop yeah, me, no, stop me, just stop me. <laughs> just, you gotta stop me, because God has a way of <laughs> snatching you out of your comfort zone and away from everything you trained for and throwing you into something that's so far beyond you that you have to be humble. Mm. People say, how can you be humble? You got no choice but to be humble. <laughs> you gotta, you're too scared not to be humble. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be humble. It's never been a strain for me to be humble. I don't understand how people struggle with being humble. You gotta be humble. You're scared to death. <laughs> God's got me doing something. Every time God called me, he called me to do something I'd never done before. I never, I didn't, I didn't grow up in a mega church. Mm. I didn't know anything about a mega church. I never belonged to a mega church in my life. I never pastored a mega church till I came here. Mm. I wasn't mentored by anybody who pastored anything like this. God had me doing things. When I went to the White House to do the inaugural message for President Obama, I had never even smelled that position. Mm. I had never seen a picture of anybody do that. Mm. To, to walk into a room and to do something that you have never done before. First time I'm on Larry King Live. I, I, and, and they're plugging you up, and getting ready and doing sound checks and getting your lighting ready, and putting makeup on your head. I'd never done anything like that before. God has a way of taking you completely away of how you understand yourself and then making you accept that this really is you. Okay, that's the other time to bring you into the awareness that you finally accept that this really is you and to break you from going back to the wine press every time you get scared and get the courage to transform into how he really sees you is the story of my life and Gideon's lives. And it sounds like most of the people in this room. Yeah. Now, that's how you elicit a response. <laughs> yeah, when I get through explaining it and explaining it and nailing it down to you, I, then it's going to be easy for you to admit, yeah, that's me. And I'm scared every day and I'm nervous every day and I'm winning every day and I'm fighting off haters who are hating somebody who's scared. 
so I have to fight with one hand and hold my heart with the other hand and keep it moving because the struggle of faith, the fiery trials that have come upon us is to embrace the ideology that, that we are what we have been graced to do. Yeah. And, and, and that, that message so resonated, it explains all the stupid things I have ever done and will do. Everything foolish I have ever done has been a result of my ignorance in understanding I was me. Everybody I thought I ever needed. There were places I went to speak, I have to be careful. There were places I went to speak that bowled me over because I thought they were so important. And their rejection of me hurt me to my heart because I thought I needed them. And later when I went back to them, I was liberated and I realized I didn't need you. You needed me. And once I, you see, 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 the first time you bullied me because I didn't know I was me. But you can't bully me because you had no power over me because now I know who I am. Do you understand? The, 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 do you, let, let me tell you how my soul is jumping up and down and dancing and, and my heart has got a party hat on it and it's blowing a whistle because it took me 50 years to get to the point that I knew who I was and I still relapse from time to time. I still relapse down and want to go back and get in the wine press. The wine press isn't sin, it's not like going back to Egypt, but it's a safe place. Where the you know where things are simpler and you have less problems and 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 you 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 you're constantly I, I I like to use this. I love when Jacob wrestles with the angel and the angel says to Jacob, "You're you're really Israel, mm -hmm. and you're not a trickster and you're not a con. It's the same kind of moment." And he says, "You have power with God and have prevailed." Yes. And he limps down off of that mountaintop experience with that angel. And the rest of his life, all the way up to when he's dying, Jacob and Israel are used interchangeably. Sometimes they call him Israel. And sometimes they call him Jacob. And such is life. Sometimes I am who God says I am. And sometimes I am who they say I am. And all the way down the end of the road, both of us are sitting here together, Jacob and Israel. And the Bible said that, that Jacob was dying, and the Bible said that Israel sat up and strengthened himself. You know, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. You know, and, and, and to me, that's, that's the way life is. There have been times Jacob was crying, and, 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 and Thomas was crying, and Thomas was afraid, and Thomas was doubtful, and Thomas worried. And there were other times that God in me stood up and strengthened me, and I was able to do what, what I was commanded to do. But that vacillating duplex nature that coexists simultaneously, yeah. Simon, see, I thought, see, the old holiness church thought it was eradicated. Mm -hmm. The old man is dead. Yeah. Everything's dead. You don't see him no more. If you was really saved like you, have you got it? Have you got it like the Bible said? You won't need it like the Bible said. You know, and so we, we sought it like that mm -hmm. and found it not. Mm. And in not finding it, we had to go back and understand that the truth is held in the tension of the debate between the wine press and riding on the horse, between Jacob and between Israel, between Thomas and Bishop. The truth is, neither one of them are lying. Mm -hmm. Neither one of them are lying. And, and being able to balance between who you're called to be and, and, and how you see yourself is a process that as you go further and further along, uh, little pieces of how you saw yourself fall off like leprosy. Mm -hmm. Little by little it drops off of you and little by little confidence replaces the elements that, that you lost and little by little, little by little you become what he called you. You know, and, and he calls you, and he calls you home. I don't read anywhere in scripture. 
after Peter leaped off the boat naked and swam to the shore that he ever got on the boat again. Mm. All of his life, he struggled to see himself the way God saw him. God said, you're a fish, you're a fish, but if you follow me, I'll make you fishes of men. And, and all while Jesus was on the earth, he was still fishing for fish. And when Jesus left and didn't set up the kingdom, he went back to doing his old job. Mm -hmm. He said, I go a fishing. Mm -hmm. And having caught nothing, toiled all night, he saw Jesus on the bank. Have you any meat? No, sir. Cash your nets on the other side, took in a great drought of fish. John said, that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Peter said, if that's Jesus, I'm going to him, leaped off the boat, swimming naked through the water, mm -hmm. only to find out that what he gave up to get Jesus, which was fish, was cooking on the shore. Mm. Mm. He swims out of the water and finds a prepared fish, leaving behind him wet fish. Mm. And, and at that moment, the forgiving grace of God so enveloped him that we don't ever read where he ever had to go fishing again. Mm. We see him again on the day of Pentecost, right after that. Yeah. And, and he's fishing for men. And he's finally become what Jesus told him he would be at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Not fishers of fish, mm -hmm. but I will make you fishers of men. <laughs> Can I tell you, you, what I'm trying to figure out is how I'm going to preach that. <laughs> you, know, you, you got, you done preached it, put it on video, it's on the world. <laughs> so when I, when I stand up and preach that, is it preaching, preaching Bishop sermon? <laughs> so I'll, I'll do it, I'll, I'll give you credit for it. You know. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care at all. That is, that is the story, as you have so rightly, of so many of us. So it's something, um, observation has always been a gift of black preaching, close observation of life and living, mm -hmm. to observe, to see, to look at, you know, to see a sermon here or to see God speaking here. Some, some people can look at it and don't see it, uh, but high quality preachers, so you can see it. It's just, you look at it, you see, you see different. So mm -hmm. in some places I'm working on something called the homiletical mind. There are, there are people whose minds are, are homiletical. Mm -hmm. You know, they can just see it. Mm -hmm. See, you can see it. Mm -hmm. So from my mind, you have, you see it so easily, and that easily is a, is a relative word, mm -hmm. and I, I keep pushing you to explain it, to explain yeah. it, because everybody doesn't see it as easily as you see it. Yeah. And we're try, trying to learn how to see. I didn't know that. Go ahead. I didn't know that because I thought, it comes so naturally to me mm -hmm. that I thought it would come naturally to anybody. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that and I didn't see that. And I later learned that I didn't allow myself to see it. Mm -hmm. Because if I allowed myself to see that, I would have to allow myself to see that I was different. Mm -hmm. And if I accepted I was different, then I would have to accept being lonely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I needed you to be like me so I'd have company. That's right. Because if I was different, then I was odd. And if I was odd, then I was alone. Yeah. And that was scary. Yeah. And I had to confront that and become okay with that. Uh, I was crafted to be me mm. by the things I suffered, the weird sufferings that made me who I am. And uh, as, as are all people, uh, but that ability I just started falling in love with scriptures. I got like around 16 years old and I could not put my Bible down. Mm. I hid my Bible in my science book at school mm. and was reading my Bible while I was supposed to be reading my science book because I couldn't have, I could not put it down. I just, it made sense to me. My father died the year before and I opened this book and it talked to me. It talked to me in the most amazing way. And, and I could understand it. Almost uh, 
this is not a very religious word, but almost magically. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know whether I was any good at it or not, mm -hmm. but I liked it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it liked me and there was something between me and it that, that was like a, a nut coming out of a shell. And, and what you just said to me wasn't about my superiority over anybody else. For me, that always read out, if I accepted that I was different, then I would have to accept that I could never find me in another person. Yeah. And that to me was a great loss. Rather than to read it as a great strength, mm -hmm. I processed it wrong. I processed it as a great loss. Mm -hmm. I was looking for me and other people. Then every preacher I ever met, I was looking for me and a friend that, that could connect with me. And, and, and I didn't know till, till after my mother had passed and this had happened and that had happened, that I was enough. That if I didn't find them, it didn't matter. That I was enough and that I could finally look at what he did to me as a blessing and not a curse. I, and I missed half of it in real time speed because I was managing it because I couldn't bear to look at it. Because if I looked at it, it would put me in a category that was even higher and scarier. I told myself, anybody could do this. Mm -hmm. All you gotta do is do this, 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 this. And it does process like that to me. Uh, but it has been very difficult for me to understand the world's reaction to me. Uh, because I'm just me. And it would be like you wake up one morning and everybody's taking pictures of you and they want to cast you in movies and they say, oh, I've never seen anything like you in all my life. Oh my God, where have you been? And all this, and the first of all, you think they're crazy, <laughs> you know? And then so many people do it. You say, well, maybe they're not crazy, but what is it? It was scary. It was horrifying. It was intimidating. It, it wasn't flattering. It was, it, was, it was confusing. I've always been like this. I've always been like this. My, when I was a little boy, we used to dress up and, and do talent shows for my mother. And, and my mother would, would do this. She would, Lord, when I heard the screen door close, I was so glad to finally be getting a chance to sit down in the front yard and sip some tea and watch the sun go down in the sunset against the maple trees over behind Mr. Crowley's house and have nothing to do but hear the sound of the music of the rocking of my chair. It was just me sitting there. And every now and then, if I perched myself just right in the seat, I would feel a breeze blow across the back of my neck almost like I had air conditioning like the rich folk. One day I was sitting out there on the front porch watching and I watched Mr. Richardson move up and park his car behind Miss Annie May's house. I don't think they meant for me to see it, but I declare I did. <laughs> I couldn't wait for Willie Joe to get home so I could tell him what I saw. But he was so tired when he got home, all he wanted was a little dinner, a little cornbread and buttermilk, and he went on to bed. But not me. Every now and then in the middle of the night, I would peek out the window and see what was going on at that house. About four o'clock in the morning, I heard the sound of gravel because he had started that truck and eased out from that yard <laughs> and didn't even turn the ignition switch when he got to the corner, but I heard it. I don't know why it was I felt led to get up at six and take some tea cakes down to her house, but just about to go for that. <laughs> you know, my mother would do that. She would, she, would, she would do that. And we would take turns doing stuff like that. And we would play these roles and write these scripts and come up with these ideas in our head. And I can do that at will. Wow. On my feet right now. And I've never been to school for it. But I can, I, I'm right there on that porch. And I can see the red clay of Alabama. And I can smell the air. 
and the smell of cows, the sweet smell of cows off in the distance mixed with the husk from the corn that's growing behind my grandmother's house. I can see it so clearly, as clear as the gravel being moved by the tires before you start the ignition because you don't want nobody to wake up in the night. That, sir, is a gift. What I mean is um, your mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the raw material, and you said it both your mother and your father, mother and father, so God was forming. Um, so it's like it's impossible to discuss great preaching without discussing you know me one the tradition mm -hmm. that comes to us mm -hmm. and secondly the particular set as you said the particular set of parents mm -hmm. and context that God gave you mm -hmm. that is, everybody don't get that mm -hmm. everybody don't get that level of imagination that level of storytelling, that level of, of creativity about life and living mm -hmm. from a mother. Mm -hmm. you know, or, so I, that's what I mean by it's just a fabulous gift. It's, a, it's an unbelievable gift. Yeah, no, I didn't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even, it, was, it, was, it was a poor folks way of having fun. <laughs> <laughs> notice, notice I mentioned cornbread and buttermilk. Only poor people know what that is. Right. You know, that, that's how my mother and them survived. It wasn't no me. Right. That's right. I didn't know that I was me because that was my normal reality. And that's what we did to fill the endless hours because the TV wasn't working and we didn't have cable and, and we weren't able to go anywhere and there was nothing else to do but use your mind and create the toys we couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. You played in the backyard with sticks and rocks and raggedy garments and threw pillowcases over your shoulders and told yourself you were Superman and imagine yourself saving Gotham City. That, that imagination gave birth in poverty. Okay. Poverty broke the water that birthed it. Yes. They created it. The problem today is that we give our kids so much yes. that they need not think of a thing. See, we had so little that all we had was our imagination. Yeah. What do they have left to imagine in the face of every gadget available right in front of their face? And that's, that's why I think what we're doing is important because I do not want that to leave the earth. That's, I don't want it. Storytelling, do you not know my DNA tests only proved what my ancestors told us we were. So our traditions were passed down through storytelling. We sit around the dinner table and we tell them, and, and, and my cousin Marlene was so and so and Aunt Wizard came down every fourth Saturday to see Papa on the front porch. They told you who you were. Yes. And today our kids have no sense of who they are. So they shoot each other in the head at 11 because they're not shooting a story. We had a story, and the Africans added to that story. I sat, I sat with the African, uh, uh, Nigerian uh, Igbo pastor who leaned over to me while this woman was talking in Igbo and said, that's what your language sounds like. Mm -hmm. And I almost lost it mm -hmm. because I had never heard it. But I kind of, I kind of knew it. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, and and he he gave me something past slavery hmm. that 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 hooked me in to something absolutely amazing. And so they put me in these. Uh, African garbs and gave me the African hat and said he looked like an evil evil man, and, and, and I could touch my ancestors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When 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 we see movies, I see history. Yes. 
And, and I, when I saw Harriet, those places reminded me of how my great grandparents lived. We were just emancipated. My great grandmother was a slave. Mm -hmm. So I can touch history. Yeah. My mama sung in the choir with Coretta Scott. Mm -hmm. I could touch history. Right. Uh, when I saw the, the help, oh my God. <laughs> If that didn't look like my childhood, and that potato salad and them porcelain bowls all flat across the top with some paprika on the top and some little green olives on it, I mean, that's exactly what food looked like. I mean, they did it to a T. And I could, my mother had 15 brothers and sisters. I could see all of them with them dresses pressed uh, with my grandmama's hot iron. That you, a, that you heated up in the fireplace and wrapped a rag around y'all too young, y'all don't know nothing about what I'm talking about. But, but our traditions passed down through our orators. And it's no wonder that we birthed the Frederick Douglasses and the Malcolm X's and the Dr. Martin Luther King, because we didn't have anything but that. And so the rich tradition that, that spawned all of us comes through pain. You know, it didn't, it didn't come through academics, it didn't come through Pentecostalism, it came through pain. Yes. Now all of that pushed the dynamics into new quadrants of thought, but the, but the original concept came through not having anything, singing in the field, picking cotton in the heat, in the hot sun, away from everything that defined you, having to redefine a new reality. You talking about born again. Our whole story is about being born again, again. And so when I look at the African food and I look at the soul food, I can tell they're kin to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the spice is a little different, but they're related to each other. And, 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 and all of that food and all of that music and all of that religion and all of that fire when we worship is, is unique to our cultural heritage. Yes. What I think is also interesting though, is that we, are, we must be versatile enough to speak in the languages of the world as well. Yes. And, and while we seek to be great preachers, we must be great thinkers and great orators and great interviewers and we must be able to speak in the language of business and commerce and politics and, and everything else that envelops the world. We must not become so self-engrossed with our traditions that we lose relevance with with all of humanity because we're part of a, yet a bigger family. Yeah. And, and if we don't find a way within that dysfunctional family uh, to, to bring black, white, red, and brown together, then all we do is become what we were, which is tribal. And, and tribal is not enough. Yeah. I want to, you know, to say to you that um, this is the beauty of, of African-American preaching that has sustained black people and others mm -hmm. for generations upon generations upon generations. And I think that you are an African-American preacher. Mm -hmm. And I think that you are an African-American preacher par excellence. And that doesn't limit you only to, but you carry on the tradition. And I want to say this, that I'm, I'm sitting here because my life's work now is that I believe that the genius of the African-American preaching tradition, the genius, the beauty, the depth, the power, the history, can generate a preaching renaissance to revive American Christianity. I believe that. And so I sit with you because I'm trying to, you can't have a preaching renaissance by yourself, right. you got to be able to explain it. You got to be able to help people see what it is, and it, you got to ain't got anything to do necessarily with degrees. You know, we teach everybody. Anybody want to improve their preaching? Mm -hmm. Because we have this tradition, and this tradition can revive American Christianity mm -hmm. in the 21st century. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you and learn and to um, ask these questions because um, this is my life's work now. 
Um, I teach preaching, I write books on preaching, and, and my specialty is African American preaching because we need a preaching renaissance, right? So I want to ask you one final question out of all of that. Um, it's not only your great oratorical skills, it's the hope. There are people who have great oratorical skills who bring people to destructive places who use those skills in the service of. So I'm going to ask you a question, and then you can go. I won't. What is the ground of your hope? Um, on a personal level, I know that God is for me. I think it's Carrie Jo wrote the song. I know that God is for me. And the first time I heard it, I had to start crying. I couldn't quit. Because all of my life, I knew that he was for me. I never could understand why. I disappointed him at every turn. But from that little boy screaming at the top of the steps, at the very top of his lungs with my father breaking up everything downstairs with an ax and my mother screaming her head off. God has always proven that he was from me. He brought me through the most horrific and the most wonderful things I've ever been through in my life with what yang and yang. <laughs> Uh, I, I am an optimist by nature. I believe anybody can get up if they fight hard enough. Hmm. I really earnestly believe that as a human being, I really believe you can because I, I did. See, we didn't talk about losing your job, lights off, water off, car repossessed, couldn't get a job, couldn't feed my family, buying a lawnmower, cutting people's grass for $8 and $10 and $15 till I got enough money to buy diapers for my boys. I've been low. So I understand the low. I know what it is to not have nothing but hope. <laughs> nothing but hope. It wasn't, it wasn't an option in the refrigerator. It was all that was in the refrigerator <laughs> was hope, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, took, I, I went out and gathered apples and fed my boys apples because that was all we had in the house to eat was apples and that was because they was free and we picked them and we fed them we ate them out and gave them apples I, I epitomize hope and, and it comes from the, the amazing bodacious soul invading grace of God that he would be for a worm like me is mind boggling but he is <laughs> But he is. <laughs> oh, but he is. <laughs> but he is. <laughs> Understand? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and I comfort what other people with the comfort we're with. I've been comforted. I know what it is to be suicidal. I know what it is to be at your wit's end. I know what it is to feel like you can't make it. I know what it is to feel like you can't get out of the bed in the morning. And I have a need to go get other people and convince them that they can get back up again. No matter what everybody's saying about them, no matter who's trying to kill them, no matter what they gotta go through, I earnestly, fervently believe you can get back up again. It may be hard, it may be difficult, it may require more out of you than you've ever been willing to give up before, but you can get back up again. I'm basically the same guy I was when I was a little boy. I've had a job all my life. Okay, I, I can't hardly remember not working. At every age, I had a hustle. 
I had a hustle going on all my life because it took the whole family to push to make things work. So uh, uh, I had a paper route when I was a little boy. My mother sold Avon. I'd help her to deliver all, whatever, cut grass, whatever. Okay. I'm coming around the road from passing papers of Mountain Road in Bandaya in Charleston, West Virginia. And I come around the corner and this, this, all these puppies were trying to nurse and, and they were newborn puppies and the German police mother was dead. And they were trying to nurse at the breast of a dead mother. And I took a box and I put all the puppies in the box and I brought them home. I guess I'm about seven, eight years old. I brought them home and I decided I was gonna make them live. So I poured out mama's palm oil of dishwashing liquid and, and, and put some warm milk in it and a little bit of oatmeal and I don't know why. <laughs> don't ask me why, but it, that seemed like it would be good. And I put it in there and warmed it up a little bit and I nursed the puppies. Well, two things I learned, that if the right person picks you up and they fight hard enough, they make you live. Because the puppies all live, I didn't lose any of them. And I learned that oatmeal gives puppies diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> really bad diarrhea. <laughs> uh, I think I'm still that little boy gathering up puppies. At my core, I still am that guy who will pick you up where you're at and feed you whatever I got to get you up on your feet so you can fulfill your destiny. And that's my blessed hope. Which is, people see you as orator, business, all of those parts and pieces. What they see you less of, this, this is my judgment, so correct me, is a pastor who has a heart for people. I think it depends on the people. People is such a big word. Mm -hmm. uh, people, I found that people who glance at you or read at you might think that. Mm -hmm. But if you stared at us mm -hmm. yes. and you saw our Tory programs and you saw our human relief programs and you saw our wells in Africa yes. and you saw our humanitarian relief, you wouldn't think that, but, but in a glimpsing world, yeah. there may be people who think that. That's not my problem, though. You keep saying that to me. No, that's, that's not, I, I, I'm not out to change anybody's mind about me. I'm really not. I, that don't bother me, whatever they want to think is fine. I want to do what I was put here to do. And yeah. A long time ago, I stopped trying to change people's minds. I submit evidence like I was on trial. Uh, when I became at peace with me, I became at peace with them. Because whatever their level of education about me, determines what they think about me. If you did real good research, you wouldn't think that, but if you just read an article with a bias or you just picked up something, you'd think whatever you want to think. The, the, not, nobody rises or falls on what people think. You rise and fall on who you are. At the end of the day, if they all applauded and I wasn't nothing, they couldn't make me something. And if they all deny me and I am something, they can't deny me something. And so what I do most of the time, this is honest. Yeah. I don't even know what I know it. they think. And that ain't what I, that's yeah. not, I got, you and I have been through this. I know that. What, I, what I'm speaking to is a pastor or a person who's got 12 people. 
Mm hmm. And I'm trying to hold on. Mm hmm. I'm trying to make it. Yeah. In there. And I, I want out of all this, that person or those persons, because I was one of those persons, mm -hmm. struggling church, trying to just, mm -hmm. to see at the, at the core of it all, it ain't got nothing to do with how many movies, I mean, that's part of your communication, the fame and mm -hmm. the celebrity. Th this is a person who's faithful to God. Mm -hmm. If it was 12, if it was 50,000, mm -hmm. to encourage the person, mm -hmm. just keep, God does all this with numbers and fame and all. That's God's yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I got a bunch of stuff, but my wife will tell you, I'm the same one. I had 30 members mm -hmm. in a rented building. Yes, sir. With a jar putting money in for the building fund. Yeah. And I have passed it thousands of people. But at my heart, same thing you're saying, at the heart, it's a call, it's a response to the call, and it's loving people, loving God and loving people. So I, I, I don't, I'm not necessarily speaking to the defense, but we miss that. We, 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 we get so caught in the, the, the trappings and titles, and I'm, some, I'm Dr. This, and I got a PhD. Yeah, but, and you, you said this better than I do, but it's not, that ain't it, that ain't well, it. You know, the funny thing about it is, if you, if you laid us up side by side, we would be yin and yang, we'd be Laurel and Hardy. Uh, and yet, if you look closer, we're really not that different at all. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you came up one path, I came up another, but there's so much more to unite us than it is to divide us. I, I think, uh, I mean, this guy's got amazing accomplishments to his credit. You should Google him to really appreciate the, the magnitude of the body of his work, his intellectualism is, is well recorded and he's highly respected in his own rights. Um, when you talk about you being a professor slash pastor, me being an entrepreneur slash pastor, uh, we've both been very bivocational throughout our lives, uh, tried to affect the world in different ways and on different platforms and, and stages. But I think beneath the titles and the degrees and all of that, and even the title of being a pastor, I think it gets down to what kind of man are you? Mm -hmm. Before it gets down to what kind of pastor are you? <laughs> That's why I went down to the little boy with no title and the puppies. Pastoring gave me a platform to do what was in my heart anyway. And, and, and I think God gives you the heart before he gives you the platform. Uh, mama and him, <laughs> you know, mama and him, <laughs> working on your your heart, your your character. Uh, I think character and morals overlap, but they're not always the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've seen people that struggled in their morals, but they had better character than people who didn't struggle in their morals, but had less character. Yeah. I know that sounds contradictory, yeah, 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 but I hope I you understand what yeah, I'm it's saying. It's a distinction, I got it. Yeah, it's definitely a distinction. The reason I say that is a lot of people become pastors to save bad character. And that won't do that. It sure won't do it. You have to be a loving person at your essence in order for pastoring to highlight and become a bridge and a conduit of expression. <laughs> we're, we're by, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. I understand. Yeah, because I see people, not bad people, people who, a lot of people who have done bad things in their lives see pastoring as the ultimate service to God. And they're trying to pay God back for getting them out of a horrible pit. And they're not bad people at all, but they don't understand 
that taking a position does not change who you are. Yeah, it, it just becomes a way in which you can express who you are. And I'm so thankful that I didn't die with all of that in me that he gave me. All of those different ventricles that look like fame or fortune are, are really opportunities for me to vent my heart, whether it's in a book or a, a film or a preaching. Uh, but all of that's coming out of, out of what he did in me. Uh, what, it, what, he, what he does through me. What he, and if you watch him closely, they all have the same DNA. Uh, and because all that you have to give is all, all that you are. And, and, and so I, I, think, uh, I, think, I think that if we understand at, at your core, if you try to correct bad, bad things that try to grow up in your garden, uh, if you wrestle with your weaknesses, and feed your strengths. Uh, I, I, I'll say this is my final story. I'm a storyteller. Uh, so Tyler Perry's first movie came out about the same time mine did. Mm -hmm. And his, uh, mine did okay. I mean, I paid off all my debts and I made a little something and it did okay. And his came out shortly after, and it did real good. And I was in the car, and I noticed every time they brought up his movie Diary of a Mad Black Woman, I think it was, I felt funny. Mm. I didn't say nothing, but I felt funny. And I've always had a good pulse on me. Mm -hmm. I'm in the car, and I said, why do you feel funny? And then I said, I think you're jealous. Mm. I thought, oh, I don't want to be jealous. I said, no, you ain't got no other reason to feel funny. I think you're jealous. <laughs> I think you're jealous because you put in as much work as he did, and you, you believed, and you wanted, and you hoped, and yet your success is supposed to not like you. Wait a minute. Okay. <coughs> Give me some water. I'm out of water. <coughs> Give me a minute. <coughs> Between the heat mm -hmm. and the lights and the change of weather. And the emotion, <coughs> and the emotion too. Yeah. Without emotions. Yeah, I didn't know I didn't have it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. I would guess too that it's emotion. Yes. That that where he I'm I'm just guessing. Yeah. Where he is. Yes. Uh, uh, hey, you, you did everything that he did. You worked as hard as he worked. You threw everything at it. You got out there advertised and marketed and and you, and you got mediocre results. Mm -hmm. Then he got mighty results. And uh, and I think you're jealous. And I thought, ooh, I don't want to be that. Mm -hmm. I said, then, then I thought to myself, that's the way them preachers are about you. Mm -hmm. They worked real hard to try to get their program going, and their conference didn't go up and yours exploded. And they watch bus loads and plane loads of people coming to hear you, mm -hmm. bypassing them. Mm -hmm. That's how they feel. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh. See, it feel different when the shoes on the other foot. Mm -hmm. So I said, I don't want that in my heart. So show me how to get that out of my heart. He don't know it. I don't want it in my heart. So every time they brought up his movie, I talked about how good it was. And every time I got a chance to bless it, I advertised it, I promoted it, I put it out there until I got it out of me. 
because whether he knew it or not, I didn't want that to be in my heart. Yes, I got you. You, you understand what I'm saying? I understand what you're saying. What I'm saying is, if you work on being a good person, hmm. and when you see something that's not good, you own up to it and fix it, uh, then, then the water that you spew won't be contaminated and God can afford to promote you yeah. because, because he can correct you. Right. Right. To, 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 to feel uh, envious was human, but to stay envious was evil. See, and, and I think there's, it didn't have nothing, I don't even think he and I have ever had a real conversation about it. Mm -hmm. I don't know conversation, because it wasn't about him, it was about purging yourself. Yeah. Yes. And not allowing the weeds and the grass to grow up in your soul and contaminate you to a point that when you do get up, whatever's in you comes out. Yes. You know, and, and the Bible said, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So peace means resolution. Yes. Resolve it. Resolve it so that when you get up, you don't have to meet that in a sermon. You don't have to meet that in a message. And whether God promotes everything or nothing in your life, you want to be at peace with who you are. The closer we get to the banks of the Jordan and the rushing waters now fill my ears, the more I have come to realize that a lot of stuff that we think matters don't matter. Yeah. If you fulfill your purpose yeah. and do what you were created to do and come down to the end, wherever that end is, it could be today. If he so pleases it to end today. But to be at peace with who he made you to be and satisfied whatever the plateau you now stand on. Hmm. You, you, you have run your course yeah. and finished that. And a great relationship emerged out of a secret friction. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Because a lot of times the people who hate on you secretly admire you yeah. And, and envy where you are. Yes. And what I saw that was as a God lesson teaching me, because I'm going to say this, we're stopping to this. Your gift can move, maneuver you into a place that your character can't handle. <laughs> mm -hmm. It can get you on a platform that you're not... You're preacher enough, but not man enough. <laughs> so if you work on your preaching, but you don't work on the man beneath the preaching, the preaching will build something that crushes the man. And, that's good. and I think it's important when we start talking about proportional grace, <laughs> that, that that grace be allocated to the man and not just his gift. Because people hear what you say, but they sense who you are. I do. That's true. And at the end of everything that you said and all the techniques we've talked about and everything that we've said about preaching, all of them are true and important. But none of them will be camouflaged for a filthy, evil person. Okay. Okay. You want to keep your heart soft. Uh, we're all human. We're all flawed. Mm -hmm. But you want to keep your heart soft enough. Yeah that, that uh, God can use you yes. anytime Amen. Amen. and anywhere. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>